Uh, thank you very much, uh, Baruch. I would also like to thank um, Murray Jose um, for uh, the consideration she's given me over the past few weeks and the gallery staff in general. I'd also like to acknowledge the novelty of this um, setup. I think it's really interesting. Uh, I'm a philosopher, I'm used to going to philosophy conferences, uh, but I think this gallery context is very exciting and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm just sorry that I'm really going to read you um, a, a text. <laughs> um, so I'm going to behave like a philosopher at the beginning, but I'm hoping to break out of that uh, when we come to the discussion part. My title is indeed called Living on the Gallows? Question mark. Living on the Gallows? Is that where we are? Um, and the subtitle is Spinozistic Strategies for a Joyful Future. This symposium is framed by a central question. Can Spinoza help us think through the pressing issues of our time? What does our future hold? What might we become? In an era that has been named the Anthropocene, will Anthropos survive? Is there a core to human nature that will endure beyond the many anticipated events that seem to imply a radical metamorphosis of Anthropos? Algorithmic subjectivities, cyborgs, sex bots, and avatars are already features of contemporary life, and they imply material, affective, and cognitive <coughs> transformations of what we are today. I think it's clear that we can't remain what we are now. This means that some of the powers we currently possess, including capacities we might have actualized in some possible future, are going to be lost. So, you know, there's branching paths here. Depending on which paths we take, we're going to lose some possibilities. Our future is uncertain, and what we do now is going to determine what we can become, which paths will be opened, which obstructed, which barred. There are increasingly fewer limits on the transformation of what was once confidently called human nature. Is this something we should celebrate? Not necessarily. Some possible futures appear horrifyingly dystopic. My talk today and my deployment of Spinoza's philosophy aims to open a conversation, a conversation that is framed <coughs> by a question. What might it mean to care for and to seek to preserve the powers and capacities that distinctively characterise the ways in which, in our present, we remain human? And how might this be done without the dreary drivers of nostalgia, romanticism, sentimentalism, or species exceptionalism, and without fear of the new, of change, and of difference being the prime motivators for such preservation? Now, there are many paradigms that offer many ways of imagining ourselves otherwise without thereby destroying or diminishing ourselves. Benedict Spinoza's way of envisaging the world involves seeing power as intrinsic to ethics, to life, and to nature, in fact, to all that exists. His is a philosophy of power, however, that counsels caution about the future and that is alert to the dangers of becoming. Spinoza was never confident about the solidity or permanence of human nature. For him, human being is vulnerable to destruction through its very plasticity, that is, through its capacity to become something else. One way to approach the difficulty and strangeness of Spinoza's thought is to compare it to a worldview that appears more obvious to the modern dualistic way of thinking about ourselves and nature. The so-called father of modern philosophy, René Descartes, compared the body of a dead man to a broken watch. To be alive, on his view, is to be a watch that is wound, or to update the metaphor a little bit, uh, a machine that has an operative battery. Human bodies, animals, and nature in general are conceived in terms of more or less elaborate self-moving mechanisms or automata. 
But Descartes distinguished human life from animals and from the rest of nature by way of our possession of a very special kind of animating battery, a soul. Souls carry the mark of their, of their divine creator like a product carries its brand. <coughs> Cartesian human souls transcend mere nature and are immaterial and immortal. A human being is a dual soul machine complex, what some have called a ghost in a machine. This dualism and its intrinsic species privilege could not be further from Spinoza's rejection of a transcendental divinity, his disdain for arrogant anthropocentrism, and his scorn for the narcissism that underlies the fantasy of human immortality. From our present viewpoint, Spinoza's worldview can look prescient, having more in common with naturalism than with the theologically infused thought typical of his own time. By his lights, animals, no less than humans, have a soul or a mind. Human beings enjoy no privileged status in nature, and nature itself is ensouled in the sense that there's no substantial separation between the divine and the natural, or between thought and matter. As strange as it sounds, all matter is animate. Stones, rivers, strawberries. Spinoza writes always of God or nature, by way of the inclusive phrase Deus sive natura. It's an inclusive or. It's not this on the one hand or that. It's this or the same thing, that. We might think of God as the active principle and of nature as what follows from this activity. Some have referred to this as nature, naturing, and nature, natured. In any case, the metaphysics is entirely imminent. As so often in philosophy, the solution to a recalcitrant problem might be to, the sh might be to show that the question was ill-formed in the first place. Spinoza's resolution of the mind-body <coughs> problem, that is the problem of how an immaterial soul can move a material body is to challenge the coherence of the concepts themselves. Souls can't cause body to move simply because there are not two things, minds and bodies. There's one thing with alternate descriptions, the body along with the cognitive and affective, and affective awareness that one has of it. The mind or soul for Spinoza is the idea of the body. And it's a complex idea because it refers to the mind's awareness of all the myriad connections between its body and the rest of nature. So the more complex a body is for Spinoza, the more complex will be the mind that is the idea of that body. <coughs> so we have particularly complex minds on his view because we have particularly complex <coughs> bodies. We're all parts of a single, vast, interconnected, and interdependent system of living nature. The various encounters between our bodies and those with which they come in contact inevitably alters our bodies along with the ideas that we have about ourselves and the world. On Spinoza's account, the body is a kind of palimpsest that retains, albeit in confused form, traces of every encounter. In the case of human individuals, the difference between one mind and the next comes down to the power each possesses to remember, to reflect upon, to organise, and to transform its experiences. This is to say that the different ways of coming to know the world correspond to the different degrees of power possessed by an individual to transform the ways in which it acts and is acted upon. In their exchanges with the rest of nature, individuals who succeed in enhancing their power to act literally enjoy more reality than those whose power of existence is thereby diminished. So power is here conceived in positive terms, as a capacity to act. Now, of course, it can also take the form of power over, power as oppressive, the power I might exert over you, but the primary uh, form that power takes is the power to act, to exist and to enjoy. Since this is what each individual desires, 
namely to survive and to enhance its power to continue to exist, the satisfaction of such desire is experienced as joy. And the um, obstruction of this desire is experienced as sadness. Human experience then might be described as a series of relays between the two poles of sadness and joy. The more we understand nature, the more active we become. And the more active we become, the more we express our power, our virtue, and our freedom. And this is why, in Spinoza's Ethics, he provides a detailed analysis of a range of affects or emotions that are generated from the, this fundamental triad of desire, joy, and sadness. Becoming free, becoming more powerful, always involves for him becoming more joyful. Okay, so that's a little bit of a um, Spinoza uh, introduction. But there's an obvious objection to this picture that I've presented. If it's a plausible account of life, then why are so many people so miserable, <laughs> so hateful, and so fearful? Why does joy appear to be in such short supply? Now, Spinoza's response is that we make ourselves miserable because we do not understand what we are or what our context is or what genuinely empowers us. We do not understand that we're part of nature and that our capacities and joys depend on and are essentially connected to the joys of all others. Put differently, human beings are most enabled, most empowered and joyful when an actively constructed harmony of forces prevails. Hate and fear, for example, drive us apart, whereas reason or understanding bring us together. But unfortunately, we know this from experience, nobody's born reasonable, and a stupid uh, egocentrism is pretty much our default state. Therefore, we need to strive to build, maintain, and protect associations, connections, and contexts which enable the development of reason and knowledge, and which will, in turn, support our mutual flourishing. There's not a transcendent force to help us do this, nor is there a transcendent force that's going to punish us if we fail to do it. Nothing forbids the construction of a world in the dystopic style. We could become ghosts in machines. To recall my opening thoughts, there's nothing to prevent <coughs> us from becoming machinic or from coupling with sex bots or from emoting through avatars or from becoming mere marionettes of, inter of internet algorithms. Nothing, that is, to prevent us outside of our own desires and joys. But one would need to desire and to take joy in the preservation and enhancement of existence understood as a collective endeavour. In some ways, Spinoza's account of the world or nature um, and of the interdependence of all that exists, it's no less terrifying than the dystopic futures that I sketched. But his philosophy is also exhilarating. The litmus test of reason is the presence of the joyful feeling, hence the aptness of the title of this symposium, Passionate Reason. Like all else in his system, Spinoza's conception of reason differs from the Cartesian picture of a detached or abstracted rationality. For Spinoza, true reason must be passionate reason, that is, joyful. It's easy enough to be passionate in the passive sense, but how do we become passionately reasonable? Now, I'm understanding this phase in a technical sense as the kind of knowledge one enjoys by way of active passion. It's, this is one way of describing Spinoza's conception of what he calls the third kind of knowledge, or intuition. Spinoza divides the various ways in which we come to grasp the world into three kinds, imagination, reason, and intuition. And it's the first kind, the imagination, that's the source of most of our problems, our misrecognitions, our illusions, our passions, which dominate our everyday lives and more often than not 
render us miserable. <clears throat> Predictably, imaginative ways of knowing are dominated by images. Impressions or memories of impressions made on the body that over time can become increasingly complex and associated with each other in ways that make them meaningful and significant. For example, we develop a narrative about our life experiences. The important point to note here is that all knowledge begins in the imagination. You, 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 you can't get to reason or intuition without the imagination, without going through imagination. So all knowledge is uh, fundamentally at the beginning, the uh, uh, impressions that we have from our bodies being part of nature. <clears throat> the imaginative stories that we construct are entirely untrustworthy accounts of the nature of the things that we've come into contact with and of the world in general. These impressions and narratives involve systemic distortions and tell us more about the experiencing body, about its uh, specific composition, its dispositions, its desires, its past, tells us more about the experiencing body than about the causes of those experiences. In the ethics and elsewhere, Spinoza explains, we have a natural disposition to invert cause and effect. That is, our natural attitude is to experience an effect as if it were a cause. And he refers to this as turning nature upside down. We affirm conclusions when we have no idea about what the premises are. And it's this attitude that lies at the center of Spinoza's critique of freedom. Our consciousness of the ways in which we are determined to act is, on his view, misrecognized as expressions of our freedom. The illusion of free will can be traced to our ignorance of causes. Our consciousness of the things that produce our experiences is essentially misleading about the nature of those things. We imagine that we're independent and self-contained wholes encountering other discrete bodies in nature, and our egocentric perspective encourages the further mistake of considering ourselves as centers of action, as free, as self-determined. Spinoza observes, I quote, uh, people are conscious of their actions and ignorant of the causes by which they are determined. This then, I'm still quoting, this then is their idea of freedom, that they do not know the cause of their actions. So long as we imagine ourselves as separate from nature, as privileged loci of freedom and self-determination, we lack knowledge of what we are and of what our context is. In one of his letters, Spinoza explains this ignorance of causes through the idea of a stone that can think. So you have to really exercise your imagination here. Imagine a stone flying through the, art, through the air that's been set in motion by some force, say a boy with a you know, slingshot sets this stone in motion. The stone, Spinoza explains, will continue to move even after the thrust of the external cause ceases, because now it's got, he says, a certain quantity of motion. What we can say about this stone, we can also say of any individual, no matter how simple or complex it is. Namely, I'm quoting from this from letter 58, by the way, um, namely, each thing is necessarily determined by some external cause to exist and produce effects in a certain and determinate way. Now, this is where the imagination really gets stretched. He continues, he asks his reader, conceive now, I'm quoting from the letter, conceive now, if you will, that while the stone continues to move, it thinks and knows that as far as it can, it strives to continue to move. Of course, since the stone is conscious only of its striving and not at all indifferent, it will believe itself to be free and to persevere in motion for no other cause than because it wills to. Now here's the, uh, the, 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 the thorn, you know, the twist of the um, story. He says, and this is that famous human freedom which everyone brags of having, and which consists only in this, that men are conscious of their appetite and ignorant of the causes by which they are determined. So the infant believes that he freely wants the milk, the angry boy, that he wants vengeance, and the timid flight.
In this thought experiment, the thinking stone experiences its propulsion as self-caused. It enjoys the feeling of flight and interprets this feeling as an assertion of its power and free will. In the same way, Spinoza says, we mistakenly interpret many of our experiences as emanating from our power of free choice rather than from external causes. But this story of the stone is misleading in at least one important respect. It cannot explain how human communities emerge and create collective identities that also generate shared systemic illusions of power and freedom. Human beings don't encounter other human beings like billiard balls on a pool table, nor as pebbles rubbing up against each other in a creek. Our encounters with what he calls beings like us, and that's a very vague phrase, right? Beings like us, I'm going to return to that. Our encounters with beings like us are recognitive, imitative, and transitive. And transitive. Spinoza's theory of our affective lives begins with a very important assertion. And here's where he uses this, you know, beings like us, a thing like us. This is um, uh, Proposition 27 from Ethics, Part 3. If we imagine a thing like us, <laughs> it's so vague, a thing like us, toward which we have had no affect, to be affected with some affect, we are thereby affect, affected with like affect. Um, it's infantile transitivism, that's what it would be called later. So you, you smack one child and the other child cries. Or I see somebody laughing and if I neither like nor dislike them, it might make me laugh. If I see somebody crying, it might make me feel sad. So you know, just the contagion of emotions is, is what he's um, you know, concerned with there. Now this complex proposition underlies the phenomenon of the contagion of affects and how such contagion can become so powerful in political contexts. I mentioned near the beginning of my talk that Spinoza did not entertain a robust notion of human nature. Indeed, in several places, he warns us against imitating animals. So these beings like us. Are animals beings like us? Who's to judge? Children often imitate animals in play. More significantly, I think, there are clear cases of non-human animals taking human children into their nurture, so-called wolf boy, gazelle boy. So it seems that there's a recognitive mutual recognitive relationship between um, human beings and animals. They seem to judge each other to be similar enough to form community. So why does Spinoza think we should avoid imitating animals? He's, and he talks about this quite a lot. Here's why. Because animals do not and cannot enhance our essential power, which is to think and to know. They may serve us at the plough or the mill or nourish us as food, but they cannot nourish us in terms of what we know. At least this is Spinoza's view. Spinoza often uses the concepts of food and poison to illustrate good and bad encounters, respectively. For example, the famous correspondence with William van Blyenberg, and I'm terribly sorry, speaking to a Dutch audience and massacring, what is it, Wilhelm von Blyenberg, <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> His famous correspondence with Blyenberg includes an explanation of the so-called fall of Adam, biblical Adam through eating of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. And Spinoza thinks that this uh, event would be more adequately framed as a poisonous encounter between Adam and the apple. And he says, Adam exemplifies the inadequacy of human knowledge and our disposition to fill gaps in our knowledge with fictions, stories, that make sense of our experience. The biblical account of Adam is that he sins through the exercise of his free will. He disobeys the command of God not to eat of the tree of good and evil. Adam interprets his fate, exile from paradise, enforced toil, 
mortality, as punishment by an angry God. Against the scriptural view, Spinoza argues, Adam lacks freedom. His problem isn't that he went against the will of God. The problem is he doesn't have any freedom. He lacks freedom. He lacks power. He's ignorant. He's entangled in a web of superstitious fictions. So Adam didn't break any commandment. He's not the object of any punishment. Rather, his state of being after eating the fruit follows necessarily from the act of eating it. And here again, we've got the turning nature upside down, the cause and effect inversion. Spinoza tries to explain to Blymberg, I'm quoting from the letter, the prohibition to Adam then consisted only in this. God revealed to Adam that eating of that tree caused death, just as he also reveals to us through the natural intellect that poison is deadly to us. So Adam's reaction, it's, it's not wicked, it's stupid, it's ignorant. His ignorance is further compounded insofar as he interprets his act and its consequences in a register of morality rather than as part of nature. He confuses the moral order, which views the act as evil, with the natural order, in which the fruits are poison. The consequence of the act lies in the relation between his body and the fruit, and the effect of combining his body and the fruit is that he's poisoned. Now, interestingly enough, Blyenberg had opened his correspondence with Spinoza by saying that he found his philosophy palatable, uh, but there are parts he couldn't digest. In particular, he could not grasp Spinoza's point that an ethical life does not require the existence of a transcendent power that judges, rewards, and punishes human beings. For if that were so, Blyenberg worries. I think Blyenberg must have been a very um, evil person. For if that were so, he worries, why would anyone be virtuous? <laughs> he asks Spinoza, what reason do I have for not eagerly committing all sorts of knavery, provided I can escape the judge? This is a quote from his letter. Why not enrich myself through abominable means? <laughs> so for him, an imminent existence equals an amoral world of sensual excess and thievery. Now, Spinoza, you know, he's, it's quite funny, this part of the letter. He says, you know, if, well, I refrain from these things because I don't desire them. I'm very worried about you if the only reason you don't refrain from doing these things is fear of punishment. Yeah, that's not, that's not virtue on, on the Spinozistic view. So um, I think those of us who endorse the idea that imminent naturalism doesn't rule out virtue, we're obliged to have some kind of response to Blindberg's problem. Um, and I think um, his question, you know, why shouldn't we all just take what we can get if there's no punishment, I think it looks much less naive today than it did um, even, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and I think this is because we do live in a time, as um, Baruch was intimating, of um, cynical pragmatism, neoliberal governments, where our employers, maybe even our families, maybe even our friends, have you know, become um, uh, very uh, cynical about um, their behaviour. I mean, we seem to be living, in fact, in an age where knaves do thrive. Spinoza's response to the question is that if a liar or a cheat finds that he can live a more powerful life through granting free reign to his vices, then he'd be foolish not to do so. But to Spinoza, the very idea involves a contradiction. He responds to Blindberg, I'm quoting from the letter, if anyone sees that he can live better on the gallows than at his table, he would act very foolishly if he did not go and hang himself. For such a perverse nature, Spinoza concludes, knavery would be virtue. Can such a perverse nature exist? It's my question, and it's a serious question. I'm not, it's not a rhetorical question. It's a serious question for our present. Reading these letters in our present has a feel that I doubt reading them in the past could have had. 
does the idea of living on the gallows still sound like a contradiction of life itself? Is the contemporary world experiencing a plague of dominations by such stupid and perverse natures? Are many preferring to live on the gallows, foolishly hanging themselves in tangled knots, composed by interwoven logics of climate change denial, ruthless authoritarianism, post-truth opportunism, post-virtue, and the hatred of different others? <coughs> now, of course, this idea is not completely foreign to Spinoza, um, despite the fact that he does do a reductio ad absurdum on you know, the idea that you could live happily on the gallows. Um, you know, for him, in the theological political treatise, for example, he observed that political power could so confute human beings that they would willingly fight for their own enslavement. How is such irrationality possible? How can people act so obviously against their own interests? Well, the illusion of freedom and the contagion of affect do not result in only individual problems in the way that I sketched earlier. The problem is also collective or political and cumulative or historical. We share illusions. Social imaginaries provide backdrops and inform everything we do know and feel. We're bound to our political communities and subcultures, not only through a common language and a shared location, but also through symbolic practices and rituals upheld by imagination and affect. Such binding constructs a material reality that functions to hold prejudices in place. It justifies them. It naturalizes them. As Hassana Sharp has argued, the popularity of materialist readings of Spinoza shouldn't obscure from view the way that he shows that bodies and their powers also find expression through ideas, images, and complex networks of linked ideas and images. And I'm in complete agreement with her when she argues in favor of caring for our ideas, nurturing them, joining them to others for the sake of their survival. As she says, I'm quoting, this is from a 2007 paper of hers, I'm quoting, the lives of ideas are determined by and dependent upon the forces, desires and strivings of other ideas, just like the lives of bodies. This is why freedom and power depend upon caring for our minds as much as for our bodies. How much care do we take with what we expose ourselves to? How many images have we all consumed in the last 24 hours? <coughs> and to what ideas and values do those images give rise? I believe this is an equally important issue to that of what poisons us, you know, to food that we literally ingest. I think this is just as important. Part of the reason for why images and social imaginaries are so important is because our affects and images are what motivate social actions. For example, political slogans. So think of the Black Lives Matters movement um, and the, 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 the chanting, you know, hands up, don't shoot, I can't breathe. Hands up, don't shoot, I can't. It's, it's a performance that's both embodied and a slogan that, that, that um, uh, joins together affects, images, language, and through these bodily motions um, to convey the statement that they wish to make. How do our ideas, images, and affects cluster? Consider three cases, just very briefly here. I'd like to say more about this, but I'm conscious of time, but just consider very briefly three cases. Three ways in which um, affects, they don't come by, they don't, you know, they don't come, they're not like pebbles in a stream, as I said, they cluster. Similarity, things that resemble one another come to be associated in our minds. For example, dogs, chairs, or trees. You know, so you see a dashan, you see a Alsatian, you see a boxer dog, but they're similar. Similar enough, you give them one name, dog. So we can form general concepts. Two, another way, they, another way images can cluster, repeated conjoinings. Things can become associated for entirely contingent reasons. For example, the, the, the actual fruit, an apple, can become associated with the word apple or apple or pom. This is the foundation of habit, but also habitus including political habitus. Three, by design, by intention. 
So manipulation, such as coupling, say, a brand of alcohol with images of beauty, youth, enjoyment. But also, and crucially for us, what we're doing here, I think, these two days, they can also cluster through the cultivation of freedom through understanding how the imagination works, what's cause and what's effect. How may one take up an active relation to the imagination, educate it, train it, use it to enhance rather than limit our freedom? And this would involve developing a politics of the imaginary capable of fighting disabling images and ideas with fighting them with enabling images and ideas. And I'm thinking here in part, I'm sure everyone, well I hope you are, uh, of the Facebook and the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Uh, I think it's something that will be interesting to discuss in this context. And again, I think Spinoza is helpful. I think he does reach out over 350 years um, with this theory of, um, of image and affect and thought. He explains how and why false ideas, once exposed, do not lose their force or effectivity just because they've been exposed. He can explain why that is, I think. Take a non-contentious example first. Let's you know, take the politics or emotion out of it, so far as that's possible. He says in part four of the ethics, I'm quoting, nothing positive which a false idea has is removed by the presence of the true in so far as it is true. And the, the scholium to, to this proposition, I'm going to quote, it's a bit long. An imagination is an idea which indicates the present constitution of the human body more than the nature of an external body. It's telling me about what kind of thing I am rather than what kind of thing the external body. For example, when we look at the sun, we imagine it to be about 200 feet away from us. In this, we're deceived so long as we're ignorant of its true distance. But when the distance is known, the error is removed, but not the imagination. That is, the idea of the sun, which explains its nature only insofar as the body is affected by it. And so it is with all the other imaginations by which the mind is deceived, whether they indicate the natural constitution of the body or that its power of acting is increased or diminished. They are not contrary to the true, and they do not disappear on its presence. It's the end of that quote. Now, so this scholium holds, tr holds true for all the imaginings that arise from affective relations between bodies of all kinds, human, non-human, individual, collective, and so on. So the nature of one's imaginary grasp of these bodies is going to depend upon the affects they engender. Do they increase or diminish one's power of acting? Do they cause pleasure or pain? And just as there's a vast difference between the knowledge one may have about the sun on the one hand and about the way the sun affects a given body on the other, you know, does it warm me? Does it burn me? Uh, so too can one distinguish between the general nature, constitution or powers of a body and the manner in which it affects another body. However, as that scholium makes clear, gaining adequate knowledge about another body, including the powers it possesses independently of its relation to me, does not remove the affect that it produces in me. That is, understanding does not cancel out the imaginary relation that I have towards it. The force of an idea does not always relate to its truth. Hateful affects can defeat fragile or developing ideas of social harmony and love. Politics is at least partly about the management of strong affects, certainly of fear and hope, but also of love and hate. As you know, philosophers like to emphasise the power of reason, the desire to know, but there's also a perverse desire not to know. Recent work in social epistemology has articulated a notion of active epistemic ignorance. This idea where one has a need not to know because to acknowledge the many injustices that mark our contemporary existence, slave labour, genocidal government policies, sex trafficking, etc., etc., would demand our attention and action. It suits many of us not to know, for example, how our T-shirts or our runners or our phones are manufactured and at what human cost. Spinoza's account of imaginaries can help explain both the ignorance of our condition, 
but also how we may develop resistance to inconvenient knowing. So consider now a politically potent example. I've used the example of the sun. Let's take a politically potent example, and I believe one that's been um, uh, deployed in the gallery recently through the um, Black Power movement, race. Now, race as a concept does not have any stable referent. <laughs> Science can't find the criteria which would justify categorising human persons according to these folk notions we have, black, yellow, white, red, whatever. The idea that certain races are inferior to white people it's not linked up. So think of the sun, you know, remember that. It's not linked up to hateful affects through adding something extra, some extra imaginative component to the thought. The idea is the hateful affect itself. It expresses and affirms the urge to dominate, to subjugate, to denigrate. And Spinoza's very clear on this. He says, our ideas are not like mute pictures on a panel. that we can say, oh, I'll affirm that one, I'll deny that one. I'll affirm that one, I'll deny that one. No. Rather, the affirmation or the denial is in the idea itself. They're vital, they're engaged, they're alive. And images and affects in the imaginary follow a certain logic, just as um, adequate ideas do. So, you know, all is not lost. This is, the <laughs> this is the good news story, I think. Inadequate ideas have equally discoverable causes, and they take a patterned and networked form that can be deciphered. But we know such understanding isn't sufficient to eradicate them. Spinoza might help explain the recalcitrant nature of ideas that have been shown to be false. Affects, he says, are generally immune to the force of rationality. Affects are best defeated by other affects. And he says this is just something about human beings. It's just something about the way we're made. For example, in the Theologico-Political Treatise, which I referred to earlier, he says about the way human beings are made. They conceive what they conceive by the pure intellect, they defend only with the intellect and reason. But what they think because of affects of the heart, they defend with those affects. Even when a single idea is defeated, its placement in a field of ideas, these clusters of ideas, might protect it from death. I think race is a good example. Ideas in the political arena, as we've seen, are parts of networks, narratives, clustered explanations that exert an energy and a force that can shield them from attack. Consider again the phenomenon of fake news. Even when specific news items have been shown to be false, although they were presented as true, or shown to be true, although they were presented as false, the originally presented story continues to play and to affect those who had consumed it. Just like Spinoza told us it would. We can't dispense with the imagination, affect, or the imaginary any more than we can dispense with our bodies or our everyday experiences of being in the world. Politics will never be, it cannot be rational in that sense. But politics can be, or it can become, I believe, more reasonable. We can take up an active attitude toward our political context by developing more adequate understandings of what we are, parts of nature who are determined by forces far superior to us, and we can become free precisely through escaping the illusion of freedom, the illusion of free will. The fake freedom of the stone, the fake freedom of the infant who wants milk, and <coughs> freely the boy who thinks he freely wants revenge. And we can do this through understanding how we are determined. And a great bonus of Spinoza's philosophy, I think, is that he doesn't conceive this liberatory project as an individual ethical project. It's necessarily a collective ethico-political endeavour. Freedom is a collective political achievement. And again, I want to draw a sort of contrast with Descartes. Um, Spinoza doesn't assert, you know, the cogito argument, I think. He asserts, we think. It's always we think for him. And what we collectively think necessar necessarily entails images and affects of part of what it is to think. 
And these imaginaries are open to challenge and transformation. So I hope to have uh, convinced you that Spinoza's philosophy offers a vantage point from which to think about some of these issues um, in, a, in a fresh way. Um, I hope uh, to have indicated how his method of passionate reason can offer strategies and resources for imagining our future otherwise. In order to imagine a different future, we need first to understand that we're parts of nature, a status that we share with all other beings, and that our well-being depends on respecting and sustaining the complex interdependencies of all planetary life. This spinozistic realisation of what our genuine powers and vulnerabilities are would propel us through an inborn impulse to survive, an impulse he calls canatus, to select, to build, and to strengthen joyful networks of active affects and to form assemblages of affirmative and non-reactive powers, all supported by reasonable collective bodies. This would mean embodying, expressing and growing that type of power that understands itself as enabled by context, connection and interdependence rather than a reactive and instrumentalist power that reckons its worth by what it can use, abuse or dominate. Domination is a greased path for power to take, especially for those who assert the fantasy of their rightful privilege through their denigration of and disrespect for the well-being of others. And I think that we see that in our political leaders all over the world today. The hard path, the path that requires courage and commitment, is difficult and its form is emergent and it's not a linear path. To borrow a concept from Gilles Deleuze who once called Spinoza the prince of philosophers, the formation of creative and joyful paths of power will be rhizomatic and selectively open to linking up with empowering connections among intersecting paths. For Spinoza, the principle of ethical selection is not determined by reason alone, nor by desire alone, but rather by a passionate reason that embraces and affirms interdependent life. As with all his letters, Spinoza's letters to Blindberg were sealed with a wax imprint of his ring, an image of a rose, which as we know is very beautiful but has thorns, and the Latin word caute, meaning caution or be careful. Perhaps Spinoza's passionate reason counsels us to be cautious about how we imagine our vulnerable and underdetermined humanity. If his philosophy offers a good approximation of what we are and what is our situation, then surely the connections we are making or breaking through our imaginings and understanding will determine the shape of our future. We need to turn away from the gallows and the foolish knaves who hang there and seek out the joyful path. Thank you. Take a moment to collect our thoughts. <laughs> Such a rich and uh, magisterial uh, presentation where we've we've really dived immediately deep in uh, to a lot of the the troubles and the and the challenges that we're confronting. Thank you very much, uh, Maura. Um, the way we'll start is that I'll invite all of the uh, all of the uh, presenters, the speakers, to. Uh, Respond if you have already some uh, thoughts that you'd like to uh, get a little bit more elucidation from uh, Mora on, and then uh, as we uh, warm up, then uh, uh, you are all welcome to uh, come up to the microphone and uh, ask a question as well. Is anybody uh, ready to go, or should I start? <laughs> okay. Well, one question is. Uh, um, so in Spinoza's, um, let's say, his suggestion that we, we attend and we, we build up our, well, we attend to the, our affects and we understand that uh, 
that uh, affects, uh, that reason cannot defeat affects, and affects have to uh, affect affects. Um, it, it implies that we can win, or that uh, you know the the uh, the reasonable somehow can win by employing affects. Not sure how how that's going to work. I mean, we we really we we even since uh, the Old Testament, you know. Um, uh, love thy neighbor. Uh, we've known better, but we haven't been able to do better. And uh, that was also the case, of course, in, in Spinoza's time, it was a fresh new Dutch Republic. So it seemed like anything was possible or that we could start afresh and do things in the right way, finally. Uh, but it was also a, uh, a, a republic that was built on, on colonialism and, uh, and uh, other aspects which were not examined. Well, it was just the way things were, right? At that time, so the the contradictions that 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 trouble our, um, our uh, optimism uh, that we, we we would try to cultivate in uh, by reading Spinoza were have always been there, and now what we have is a situation where, uh, for example, the rule of law and uh, the structure of society, um, which you know is an amazing accomplishment, we have these 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 amazing robust states where we can have a, a, a rich exchange of information and, and, uh, and commerce, etc., uh, ha has become automated. We no longer depend on people anymore to be reasonable. We've kind of automated the reason <laughs> to, another, to another level. I don't know if that's something that is making the contradictions appear again in this, in this state. I don't, I don't know if that can lead you in, into a response. <laughs> Um, well, I, I'm... Do I really need it? Yeah. Uh, it's just for the for posterity. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't intimidate me, will you? Um, I'm not uh, optimistic. Um, I did say that uh, Spinoza's path, it seems to me, is no less intimidating than the dysto dystopic futures uh, that one can imagine. As he finishes the ethics, as you know, he says, you know, every, it's, um, it, it's very difficult um, to be rational, to be reasonable. Uh, but I also said that I think that uh, Spinoza's philosophy is exhilarating, and I do think it's exhilarating. And I don't think we should uh, confuse joy with happiness. They're not the same thing. Um, finding out something really, really terrible that makes you um, very sad can nevertheless, well, not sad, but that it can nevertheless be joyful. Um, uh, so I don't think we should confuse joy and, and happiness. Um, but what I do think is interesting about Spinoza in the present is he could not have known quite how relevant his theory about images and the imagination could be, how powerful that theory could be, because his own context was not dominated by images in the way that our context is dominated by images. So if you find this uh, view convincing, uh, then uh, the number of people who won't eat, say, genetically modified food, or who are vegan, or who you know, don't want to eat, uh, they want gluten-free bread and so on. Uh, I mean, I'm with Hassan Sharp here. Um, don't uh, the worship of the body, you know, and, and I think the materialist take on Spinoza must not end up being reductively materialist because Spinoza is not reduc a reductive materialist. Uh, so um, I think there is an analysis here of the harm that images, and, and what, I, I would think immediately of pornography and the ways in which um, the, uh, the recent extraordinary spread of pornography has, um, you know, it's on everyone's phone, the kids are watching it from when they're eight or nine years old or whatever. It's changed the way people are engaging with each other sexually, emotionally, the, what the things they're doing to their bodies and so on, you know. The, I think there are all kinds of ways of thinking about regulating not just the poisons and the nourishment that one uh, literally um, worries about in the present, 
but also the ideas and the images that you're nourishing or not your body with. So, I mean, I think that's something that I don't think people really talk about that. And, and as I say, it's very hard for that not to be end up sounding like, oh, you're just a wowser or, um, you know, this is a regressive or, or whatever. I think this is a new way. Uh, you know, it's a new application of thinking about the political imaginary that I think does have resonances with some of the more interesting things that's been going on in, say, epistemic injustice, um, uh, you know, notions of uh, the ways in which um, images, uh, the social imaginary function to shut down certain pe person's abilities to be heard. You know, so I, I, I really think that there's a, there's a lot of work to be done, but I'm not, I'm not particularly optimistic about the ease with which it can be done. And following, in, following on this line, what does Spinoza help us to think today? And uh, trying to reframe this within a materialist tradition, I think uh, very early in time, Spinoza had the courage to think um, materialism not as primacy of matter over idea, or that we don't, if, if we think about materialist traditions and philosophy, we don't have to uh, return to the reductive idea, oh, is there a primacy of idea over matter, or of matter over idea? It is about a philosophy of genesis. What Spinoza teaches us is to, to, uh, to think um, through, or to grasp how things come into being. If I want to have an idea of something, I have to know how it comes into being, how it is generated, how it is produced. And through this thinking genesis, he also thinks a genesis of thought. I mean, and the genesis of thought goes through the body, through sense, imagination, and so on. And there is another thing within the materialist reading uh, particularly in the French tradition since the 1960s of Spinoza, which I find um, very interesting, maybe also for a critical debate. I'm understanding that we want to have a critical debate about uh, societal conditions uh, of today, is uh, that Spinoza also has the courage to develop a very strong notion of condition. It, it's, it's a materialist metaphysics who says, okay, this... Uh, capacity for intuition, for reason, for the jump into reason, everyone can think, comes under conditions. And the conditions are starting from our sense apparatus and goes up to the theological political apparatus under which we think. And the long tradition of domination, which is anchoring in our capacities. And within those capitalist societies we are living in now, and I think the, now at our conjuncture there is a certain kind of speaking about uh, Trump, Erdogan, to have a certain kind of um, maybe even hysteria over fake news, and, but not really, or climate catastrophe. So a lot of kind of um, having a, looking on the apocalyptic peaks of problems, not on the structures. With Spinoza, we would have to say, okay, what are the structural genetic problematics of our conjuncture today? And that will be certain elements of an oppressive state apparatus, certain uh, elements of the self-valorization of capital, which comes up with a hyper-abstract, what you said, it's an automatic subject, it's a hyper-abstract logic, which has, is one of the major conditions of our life today. And there is something I think Spinoza couldn't have seen at his time, which maybe then Nietzsche and Foucault and that line of thinkers start to see that bodily corporations conjunctures of capacity to act is something the Western tradition of capitalism is kind of fostering. They are, you said we should be carefully uh, distinguishing joy and happiness, but I think we really have to work on how 
our capacities to act, to think, to work together, to, to be joyful, to engage on all levels of bodily, imaginative and thought experiments within a kind of um, integrative structure of the society, that there is a certain hijacking of cooperation and capacity, which is at the center of Spinoza's project. And we would have to kind of develop within this line of thought distinctive elements to distinguish those ways of cooperation and others. And I'm not really sure if, if ha happiness or maybe we could start if you uh, explain it a bit more how you think happiness and joy would be one way to distinguish possessive individualist ideas of being joyful in our societies from another kind of joy which would be more into a critical line of existence and a line which would, is not um, uh, ready to, to destroy other forms of life. Yeah, it wasn't a complex thought about, um, about <laughs> happiness, really. Um, it's, you know, the Aristotelian notion of um, uh, eudaimonia might do the same job. I mean, what, all I mean is, you know, I got very happy the other day. I bought a jacket. I think it's fantastic. You know, that's, ha that's happiness. It's not joy. Um, it's not like, you know, reading an article and understanding something I didn't understand before. Um, so, yeah, sorry, that was not a complex thought. What I think Spinoza uh, gives us a reason to be optimistic about is that we can understand these affects. That's, they're not erratic. They're not, you know, these sort of irrational things that we can never understand. We can understand them. Um, and, and I think, you know, part of um, understanding who and what we are it is, should be understanding that we are not free in the way that we imagine ourselves to be free and the cause of our desires, I suppose. Yeah, I think, and I do think that's very relevant to contemporary, con contemporary capitalism and the way that it uh, uh, captures people's desires. Maybe you should hang uh, okay, there's, a, there's one. Uh, 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 Torkild was already yeah. uh, first, but uh, also I'm going to take privilege to just uh, make a, <laughs> a cor corollary there. Um, the, no, no. I, I'm just, I'm just um, uh, as an uh, idea that you were pointing to uh, using images against images, and, and uh, you were pointing to the, uh, this uh, hysteria or hype about um, uh, apocalyptic visions, especially that of, of climate change. The, uh, one idea that, that may be interesting to explore maybe a bit later, actually uh, Beth will be talking about uh, uh, climate change later, so maybe that will be the case, uh, where, we can turn the Im uh, where we can turn the opportunity of the hype of the image against, to, to have a, 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 a vector of action that was unprecedented so that, you know, maybe uh, uh, to make an argument for redistributive, uh, redistributing wealth generally on, on the earth w is a hard one to make. But maybe if we make it in the, in the context of the climate crisis that is necessary to address global wealth inequality in order to address the climate crisis is possible, right? Because the climate crisis has presented us with this apocalyptic image. That's just one point. Thank you very much, Moira. Uh, at the risk of, of uh, sidetracking or, or, or um, uh, the conversation a little bit, then um, since you, I, I'd, I'd like to pick up on on the notion of joy and to do so in relation to um, uh, the climate crisis. Um, in Sweden, not just in Sweden where I live, but across the world, Greta Thunberg has been a phenomenon. And, uh, and ob she obviously inspires collective action across the world, but particularly among, among young people. Uh, but uh, she doesn't only do that by referring to scientific reason. She also do that through, through anger and I think a little bit by, by um, appealing to our bad conscience. Now, insofar as that bad conscience uh, helps inspire uh, collective action, uh, you know, I think that's, that's really terrific. But on the other hand, it also creates a lot of aggression and resentment 
circles about amongst the amongst the, the denialists. So I guess I wonder i wonder if you you could speak to to the possibilities of more joyful affects and the importance of more the role of more joyful affects in in um, in 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 the in the collective challenge of um, of uh, uh, fighting the, the the climate crisis. Yeah, um, I was going to ask you about something else entirely, but um, I mean, I suppose I suppose the point is that that Spinoza wouldn't deny that using emotion is a very effective way of, of spreading a message and of getting people to be aware of something. Um, does strong emotion get people to understand a situation? No. <laughs> uh, do, we, do we see widespread understanding of the climate crisis through, through Thunberg and, and the emotions that she inspires? I'm not sure. We certainly see greater awareness. We see greater emotion around it. We see, um, to some extent, greater action. Um, but I'm not sure whether it leads to understanding. So, uh, thank you very much. So, um, I really appreciated how you put together so several topics in Spinoza and, and point to the centrality that the political action has for his overall moral theory. And I really like the way in which you emphasize this vague terminology that he uses, the things like us. Right, that resonates with all kinds of imaginations we may have about that thing. And of course, you linked that with the theory of imitation of affects, which is also a kind of central piece in, in his ethics. So it's, it's a central turning point between the individualistic ethics and the political action. Right? And at some point, you mentioned that egocentrism is a kind of default condition. Right? So I'm here, and I see other people there. And so that thing like me, so it's having that affect, so I may imitate that under certain circumstances. So the thought I had is that maybe you might elaborate a bit more about not only how desires shape, shapes me as this ego here, but also my imagination of the other. Because actually, the other is very much a fiction. And there are several affects that Spinoza discusses, glory, ambition, envy, in which I imagine how the others will judge me. But most of the time, even in our daily life, the others, who are they? We couldn't, couldn't pinpoint to individual people, it's just a vague imagination. It's more like what Heidegger would call the they, to some extent. And so this means that the other is also an imaginative construction, which most of the time is an inadequate idea. And so I'm not sure what you think about that, but the kind of thought I had is that maybe we should not try to form an adequate idea of the other, because insofar as we don't know what the other is, then remains open the possibility that we still don't know the other. So we should be also open to be wrong, to act in a different way, and not to impose my view on the other. But I don't know whether you want to go in this direction. I think that's, um... Thank you. That's a very, very interesting um, thought. Um... And it puts me in mind of his uh, comments about the exemplar uh, in the preface to part four um, of the ethics, uh, where he talks about the exemplar of the wise man and the, the free man. And it seems to me that that exemplar is provisional um, and open to revision. So the very things that you're warning about, I think he sees already. Uh, and, and as you know, he warns us that you will become like those you associate with. So you should take care who you associate with. Um, and you should take care of the favours that you... You know, he, he, he says things like this, you know, don't... Uh, you know, but you don't take favours from idiots in a way, but in another way, you don't want to offend the idiots. They can be very dangerous, you know. So it's always a balancing act between 
um, you know, the knowledge you have about who you are and what your context is and the knowledge that other people have of who you are and what their context is. So he's very much about... It put, puts me in mind of um, the way in which... You know, my individual body, for him, is capable of joining with other bodies to make another individual body that's of a more complex nature. Um, and the knowledge that those bodies have of themselves, we may disagree here, I'm not sure, will determine their capacity to act rather than be acted upon. Um, so I think that we are absolutely not transparent to ourselves, so of course others are even less transparent to us than we are to ourselves, but I think once we form um, complex bodies, if they are joyful bodies and they're functioning bodies, this does, you know, fun bodies that are functioning well for whatever it is that they have joined together in order to do, you know, a good seminar, a fantastic reading group, you know, there are good ones, there are bad ones. Um, you know, when they are working well, the joyful feeling comes. And so that's why I said in my talk, it's like the joy is the litmus test. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm sorry it is vague, but I would want to again distinguish joy from happiness. Um, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, he, he, he does talk about, doesn't he, the, the kinds of... Uh, um, uh, pleasure that we can have when one part of the body uh, is, um, is pleasured. And he distinguishes that from uh, a, a more gen hilaritas, a more general sense of well-being. And I think, again, that's a kind of litmus, um, a kind of litmus test. But um, it, it sort of goes back to something Baruch started us off with, in a way. There's no guarantee here. There's no plan. And there's no transcendent power who can say, oh, now you've got it right. Um, or, you know, I'm going to punish. All there is is experimentation. I think Deleuze is a very good reader of Spinoza in this sense. All there is is experimentation. Is it working? Is it not working? And when it is working, you get the litmus test. If it's not working, um, you know, net nature um, poisons you or nourishes you. <laughs> um, but, I, but I think, um, to go back also to some of the earlier discussion, um, um, yeah, no, maybe not. I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah. So I wanted to ask um, about nostalgia, which you mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, so you, you started by asking the question, what might it mean to preserve the ways in which we remain human without falling back into nostalgia? And I wonder how you think um, Spinoza allows us to get over nostalgia because it is such a tempting trap to fall into. Um, and we indeed see nostalgia uh, as, as being a kind of a dangerous affect alongside some of the affects that you've talked about and, and, and the um, circulation of images and the hateful affects that go along with them. Nostal we've seen that nostalgia has a political force and so on in recent years. So um, nevertheless, nostalgia seems like a comforting place to go when we, when we want to escape the present. So I wonder what you think about how we avoid that. Thank you for a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Answer. <laughs> um, well, here's what I think. Um, I, th I think that uh, nostalgia is a safe place. And so it's going to be a retreat uh, into what you know already. Uh, and insofar as it's that, it's not um, a spinozistic uh, um, search for knowledge. Uh, and, I, and, I th and I think... Um, you, I mean, we see it all over the world. I, I think some of the aggression toward, you know, refugees and different others and so on, very much about nostalgia. You know, I want things to be the way they were when I was a kid, you know, the way the neighbourhood was then or, or whatever. So I think the encounter with otherness is absolutely crucial to keep... Um, uh, ..to keep seeking out, you know, these differences um, and, and, and negotiate the new. So. I'm in favour of that. What I'm not in favour is, is what I sometimes uh, see and hear uh, at conferences and in written work, 
where the new is valued for no other reason than it's new. And I just, I just think, why? Why? Maybe the new's terrible. You know, like there's monsters there. You know, there's really, there really are terrible things that can happen to us. You know, just because it's new doesn't mean it's good. So um, I suppose what I want to try and say today, and I, I realise it is a bit provocative, is, you know, is there something, you know, post-humanism, blah, 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 blah. Is there something we want to preserve here about what it is to be human? You know, to be conservative in the literal sense. We, there's something we want to conserve or preserve. You know, is, is there? And I think that is something um, that, that is about, uh, that can, it's a collective question. It's not something I can answer. It's something I raise uh, to, to, to provoke. Um, Um, yeah, I, I think I, I, it has something to do with this, but it also goes back to something that Andrea said in the beginning, which is going back to this idea of things like us. What does that even mean? Uh, and, and you said it's very, very vague in Spinoza what he means when he talks about things like us. And I think it's a qualified vagueness in the sense that he wants it to be vague because, because what he's saying is that, is that the way that we effectively connect to other say, things or people or whatever, is based on similitudes that are perceived. And these can be perceived inadequately or adequately. Huh? So it's, a, it's not a question of things that are in fact like us, it is things that might be in fact be like us, or it's something about the things that we perceive as just being like us. We can perceive other people to be like us because there are, you know, Danish like me because we have the same name in the, the same country in the past in the passport or because they have the same color of the skin or because they have the same body index mass mass index or whatever uh, all these kinds of very general concepts that we that we, we construct out from the imagination of what things like us are and these may be very inadequate but one of one of the things that are that are forced that are very powerful in Spinoza and which has been taken up by I mean, there's a lot of nonsense in this new materialism movement of, of, of theory these days, but one of the things that they, they, they have understood is that you can use Spinoza to get over problems of social constructivism. That, that means the idea that you construct, that the, anything goes, as it were. All kinds of communities that you construct, it's just about perceived similitudes, and that's fine. No, actually, in someone like Spinoza, there is a ground level here. There's a ground level of ontologically grounded similitudes. And these similitudes are effective similitudes. We, things that are like me are the things that are affected by the same things in the same way as I'm affected by them. <coughs> I mean, you wrote a very nice paper. I mean, Deleuze also talked about this when he compared Spinoza with uh, Jakob von Wexkühl and mythology. And you wrote about this many, many years ago. I remember in the 20 years ago. I can't remember. Yeah, I can't, I can't. It was one of the first papers I ever wrote of Ren on Spinoza. So, so these ideas are of having sort of an ontological ground level where we can actually construct real communities, as it were, which I think is a very powerful thought in Spinoza. And this has something to do with also how we construct adequate ideas, because to construct the real community means that you have to understand real similitudes. And to understand real similitude is to understand that we, we are in a community with people who are affected in the same way as we are by the same things. And how do we do that? Well, I think one of the things that Moira said just before, I think that's very, very important in Spinoza, is that we construct what Spinoza calls a common notions, or common notions of human nature, for example. And, the, and for example, the exemplar he speaks of is a common notion of human nature that we can construct, and that's variable. It changes with circumstances all the time. So it, it means that in different historical circumstances, we will construct the exemplar or common notion of human nature in different ways. Um, so these days, for example, because we are in material circumstances where you can start and have you know, uh, 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 um, uh, artificial limbs, for example, uh, transhumanism, for example, will change very much the idea that we think about human nature. But there will still be a human nature. Uh, there will still be a human nature, but you can still construct adequately communities about effective 
similitude. So I think I, I, I'm actually just sort of repeating many of the things that Moira said in, in, in other ways, uh, and the things that, that, that from her paper that I, felt, that I felt are really, really important for the ways that we can use Spinoza today, namely this idea that there are real similitudes and you can adequately understand them. And the other thing, uh, which is also from, from Moira, is about the distinction to see. I'm not quite sure I would make the, 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 the distinction between happiness and joy exactly in the way that, that she does it, but there's one thing, which is the happy thing about, uh, 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 about Spinoza. He's, he's what you could call, um, uh, he, he's, he's, uh, he's an intellectualist uh, ethicist. He actually thinks that the joy that you get out of knowing adequately, even a very, very sad thing, will necessarily be more joyful than the sad thing, than, than the sad thing is sad, as it were. Huh? So if, if, if you're in a situation that you really, I mean, you can get really sad by climate change, but if you really adequately understand what goes on, the joy you get out of that knowledge, he actually believes that that joy is bigger than the sadness about climate change. I don't know whether that's true. Uh, uh. We'll see. But I actually think that's what he thinks. And that's what makes Spinoza into the great rationalist oh, of our times. So he's, he's the great rationalist because he really thinks that the joy that you get out of, get out of knowing is always superior to the, to the sadness you get uh, uh, on the sort of on the imagined but you level. Know passionately. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's not just yeah. rationalism. No, no, no. No, it's, it's, like, it's like affects that are confront each other. You have an aff the attitude. Have, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's, a, that's definitely a question. I mean, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, question of moral intellectualism, does it work? Who knows? Huh? Well, we're all being affected uh, at the same time uh, by this wonderful discussion. I think uh, I owe it to uh, at least one person in the uh, audience who want, want to ask. Can you come up to the microphone here, please? Uh, just one question from the audience. Uh, it's a token uh, democracy here for today. <laughs> Could I just ask you a quick question before you disappear there, um, before you go away from the microphone? Um, is your question a little bit about uh, how can you talk about Newtonian cause and effect when we're in a sort of post-Einsteinian uh, um, <laughs> physics? Or is, is it that kind of question or not really? When I had some discussion this year with my group, yeah. um, sometimes I had the impression that you know the discussion between Heisen and um, um, Niels um, Bohr. Yeah, Bohr. yeah. And so it is that. Yeah, and you have this yeah. kind of uh, the 
point was that Einstein said, we don't know the cause of yeah. these things, there isn't any probability. Yeah. Instead, in the... Yeah, in so, the I'm, so I'm right. Yeah, I think that's... So, yeah. Yeah. so this is... It's, so the, the question is... Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I think I think I've got you. Uh, there are. You might be interested. I, I'll I'll think of the reference. I'll find it on my. I'll, I'll look it up for you. Uh, there are um, interpreters of Spinoza who think that his theory is compatible with string theory. So, you know, there are people who are reading Spinoza in these interesting ways. Uh, but what I would say to uh, the, that question is that we know that asbestiosis, for example, is caused by asbestos. It's very simple cause and effect. You breathe in those little particles and you, you, your lungs are damaged and you die. Um, it's a very simple cause and effect. I do think that clumsy... Uh, you know, common sense way of thinking about the world does us uh, pragmatically just fine uh, for a lot of the time. Um, uh, you know, I, I think uh, social re research tells us that certain kinds of behaviour can be modified by using um, levers of uh, reward and punishment. I mean, these are just very... They're, they're, they're uh, I guess, in a sense... Uh, in, in relation to physics, they are uh, primitive notions of cause and effect, but pragmatically they're perfectly effective uh, in the context that I've been using them today. Um, so I, I, I don't frankly see a problem there. Uh, but going to Spinoza's metaphysics, he is one of the most epistemically modest philosophers, I, I believe. Um, he says often you know, in his correspondence, I don't know how all the bits of nature fit together. Um, you know, he says quite frequently, I, I, don't, I don't know how the body functions. It's incredibly complicated. Um, so I do think uh, he... I think he leaves, op he leaves the door open for the increase of human knowledge just in the way that it has, um, uh, has sort of increased. Does that answer your question? I'm, I'm saying no. I'm saying no, you don't. I think it works just fine. Um, for, uh, I mean, you know, on the one hand, he says every material thing is animate. So on the one hand, you know, he's with contemporary physics. These things aren't solid. He, th he doesn't think this is solid. He, you know, he thinks, he thinks the, uh, the strawberry has some kind of primitive idea of what it is. Uh, so, you know, a very, it's a very eccentric view in, another, in one way. In another way, he just thinks, if Adam thinks that he's being punished by God, he's got the cause and effect muddled up. Adam has been poisoned by a fruit. That's what Adam needs to know. He needs to understand, you know, simple cause and effect as it operates in nature. I don't see any reason to revise that. Uh, but my colleagues might disagree, I don't know. We'll have time to disagree as uh, the day goes on. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to um, uh, ask us all to uh, please give um, Dr. Moira Gatton's a uh, big round of applause for a wonderful presentation.